third chapter is called Global Weirding. Global Weirding, a term coined by uh, Hunter Lovins uh, here at the Rocky Mountain Institute. It's a chapter basically about what all of this global warming is going to produce, which if you heard John Holdren's talk the other day, is not this gentle sounding thing called global warming. It's going to produce global weirding. The weather is going to get weird. Uh, we're going to get hotter hots, longer droughts, heavier rains, heavier snowfalls. What I focus on in this chapter are really two points. One is philosophical and the other is uh, quite technical dealing with weather. Philosophical point is this, it came up in a discussion with uh, one of my real teachers, Nate Lewis, an energy chemist at Caltech. I was out talking to Nate um, last year and I asked him, Nate, what was it about Katrina that so bothered us? What was it about Katrina? It wasn't just the damage, there was something deeper. And Nate rolled that idea over in his mind for a few seconds and he simply said, who made it hot? Who made it hot? hot. You see, we have introduced so much CO2 into Mother Nature's operating system, we no longer know the difference between an act of God and an act of man. Did we make it hot or did he make it hot? Did we make Katrina or did he make Katrina? We, we don't know anymore. My friend Heidi Cullen, who's the one climatologist at the Weather Channel, that's a story in itself. Um, the Weather Channel has one climatologist. Always reminds me, you know, when I grew up in Minnesota back in the 50s, if we had a warm day in February in Minnesota, we said, what a gift, what a gift. Now, as Heidi said to me, we say, did we pray pay for that gift? Did we make that gift or did he make that gift? We, we don't know anymore. Now there's many things I could talk to you here about climate. I'm really not gonna go into uh, detail about this argument. But to me the most, most important thing going on right now basically in all the kind of de debate and denialism around climate is this, is that the actual things happening in our climate system are, so, are, are now moving so rapidly and so much farther beyond anything that was being predicted just five years ago in so many areas. That is the real story going on today. As John Holdren talked about, I discuss in detail in my book, you know, we, th we thought the Arctic sea ice might melt by 2040 in the summer, then it was 2030, then it was 2020, then it was 2010. Now, it may be this summer. I like the way my, my friend Nate Lewis, there's one favorite quote I have in this chapter. He says, you know, we can measure ice core data going back 670,000 years. The average temperature we can measure year by year of our planet. As well, we can measure the average CO2 concentrations. We know from that ice core data going back 670,000 years that the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere that we are experiencing right now is going to give us a different climate than the one we have been used to. Because in 670,000 straight years, whenever CO2 has gone up, temperatures have gone up. And whenever CO2 in the atmosphere has gone down, temperatures have gone down. So for climate deniers to say, that the additional CO2 added by humans is not a problem is to bet against 670,000 straight years of data and hope that this time around we'll get lucky. Ladies and gentlemen, basically what we are doing right now on the climate as things get hot, flat and crowded is we're running, as Bill Collins says, a friend of mine at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, we're running an uncontrolled experiment on the only home we have. The next chapter is about biodiversity loss. It's called The Age of Noah. It begins in a couple of zoos in China where the world's last known female Yangtze giant softshell turtles, two of them are living, one a male, one a female. They're trying to get them to mate. One is 80 years old, the other is 100 years old. <laughs> right now they're working on artificial insemination. The point of the chapter, though, is this. We are the first generation of human beings that are going to have to think like Noah. We are the first generation of humans who are going to have to think about saving the last two 
repairs. We are in the middle right now of a extinction period, which groups like Conservation International call the sixth great extinction in the history of the Earth, where extinction rates of species, plant and animal, are now running at a thousand times the norm. Basically, according to Conservation International, one species goes extinct every 20 minutes. Now imagine if any other trend in the world were a thousand times the norm. Imagine if rainfall were a thousand times the norm or spread of HIV AIDS or snowfall. We'd, we'd take note of that. Well, basically we are in the middle of an extinction crisis of our biodiversity that is a thousand times the norm. And this chapter basically goes into detail on what the implications are. Because friends, we are now the flood. We are the flood, and we need to build an ark. The last of these five problems is called energy poverty. Energy poverty is a huge and growing problem in the world because there are 1.6 billion people on the world, on the planet today, who have no on-off switch in their life. They have no grid electricity. One out of four people on planet Earth have no on-off switch in their life. Now, being energy poor was always a problem, but when the world gets hot, flat, and crowded, it's really a problem. Because if you were energy poor 50 years ago, well, you know, I grew up in Minnesota in a small suburb of Minneapolis. I rode my bike to the library. It was a, maybe a mile away, and when I got there, there were books on the shelf. And if you're a poor kid in Burkina Faso, you may have to ride all day to the library 50 years ago, but when you got there, there were also books on the shelf. Well, if you have no electricity today, that means you can't get online. That means you can't get to Google. That means you can't search all the world's knowledge. You can't shop in all the world's stores. You can't surf all the world's libraries. So being energy poor today means you don't just fall behind arithmetically. You now fall behind exponentially. And this chapter is about that problem. What do we do about it? Um, this is a hopeful book, ultimately. <laughs> if you've been reading my column, you know I don't do pessimism. So, um, what do we do about it? Um, basically, the transition chapter is called Green is the New Red, White, and Blue. And my feeling is, is this, and I, I want to read it to get exactly right, that in a world that's hot, flat, and crowded, clean power, is going to be the next great global industry. Because in time, and it's going to be soon, the world is going to force everyone to pay the true cost of the energy they're using, the climate change they're causing, the biodiversity loss they're triggering, the petrodictatorship they're supporting, and the energy poverty they're sustaining. These costs will either be imposed by Mother Nature, by individual governments, by consumers, yours or someone else's, or by your own kids who will not allow you anymore to charge their future on your visa card. Because the costs have all reached a stage of criticality where their impacts on the world can no longer be externalized, ignored, or confined. And that is why in a world that is hot, flat, and crowded, clean power generation and the tools we need for greater energy and resource efficiency are going to be the next great global industry. They simply have to be if we want our planet to remain habitable. And therefore, the ability to build, deploy, and export clean energy systems and technologies is going to become a currency of power in the energy climate era, not the only one, but right up there with computers, microchips, and weapon systems. These green technologies will become critical in determining a country's economic standing, environmental health, energy security, and national security in the next 20 to 30 years. Some see that now, others will see it soon. Eventually, it will be obvious to all. I hope every country gets there sooner rather than later, but most of all, I want to make sure that my country, the United States of America, is in the lead. If America seizes the opportunity to solve these problems, it will be a huge engine propelling our economy in the 21st century. 